Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, to uh, Microsoft uh, 365 UK user group. Uh, welcome to uh, the new members uh, as well as the uh, existing members. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And so we have today uh, over 70 attendees. And so uh, feel free to post your questions, answers, comments uh, on the right hand side and the Q&A uh, chat bubble uh, icon you will see. And uh, obviously this event is being recorded and uh, should be made available uh, by this Friday. So once again, uh, welcome all. So uh, just like to say that, you know, we've got uh, two uh, great, uh, well, three great speakers uh, for our two sessions today. Uh, we've got Joel uh, Rodriguez with us, uh, who will be delivering the first session uh, on the securely connecting the uh, to SharePoint online from a variety of Azure functions. And then we will take a short break around about 5 p.m. And we'll then reconvene back to uh, uh, welcoming uh, Zoe Wilson and uh, Luke Evans will be uh, delivering session around the uh, Microsoft Teams usability versus uh, security. So we'll catch up with them in a, in a little while. But for those of you who are new to uh, the, uh, the N365 UK, uh, my name is Chirag Patel. Uh, I can be reached uh, through techchirag.com. And uh, I am the organizer and run this on a monthly basis uh, for a living. I work as a Microsoft 365 consultant uh, in in various capacities as a trainer architect and uh, also uh, kind of been working with SharePoint and, and Office 365 for, for many years now and those are some of the certifications that I carry just purely to keep up to date like many of us uh, as things change very frequently these days and so um, uh, you can feel free to uh, reach out to me on that uh, uh, for anything that I can uh, possibly help you out. For some of you, uh, you know that you know we've been going on for uh, about just over a year now, really just uh, just about when the pandemic kind of started. And so, you know, we've got all the sessions recorded, as as some of you will know. But for those of you who are who are new, um, next month we we won't be around. Um, so we'll be next back around 8th of September. And so it just kind of gives uh, us a bit of a break, some holidays, if you like. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, just uh, stay tuned in to the meetup.com uh, forward slash uh, M365UK. Uh, and I'll send out the communications uh, when we have the, uh, the speakers, everything lined up. So for for the remainder of the, you know, the, the year and next year, uh, planning is already underway to bring some of the some of the great sessions there. So. Um, so, yeah, do, uh, do check that out. And then I've got some new folks who've, who've submitted their sessions, which I'm currently reviewing them. And like always, uh, you're always welcome to submit uh, your own experiences uh, or sessions, uh, anything around Microsoft 365 UK, SharePoint, Power Platform, Security Compliance, uh, you name anything that touches uh, Microsoft 365, uh, I'd love to hear from you uh, and really share your experience. And if you're new to speaking or would like to get into speaking, uh, I can help you out on that uh, uh, as well. So don't be uh, shy and uh, there's the URL and I'll post the URLs in the in the Q&A uh, window shortly so you can uh, access those links uh, straight away. So today uh, we got, uh, like I mentioned, we got Joel Rodriguez. Uh, he's a three-time uh, Office Development uh, MVP. Uh, been working with SharePoint for well over ten years as a consultant, uh, delivering variety of uh, uh, solutions uh, constructed primarily within SharePoint. But now, obviously, he works in other areas of Microsoft 365, uh, and also a occasional contributor to the uh, the Microsoft PNP. Uh, initiative as well, so contributing his samples codes to them as well. So his session is about you know securely connecting to SharePoint online, but also building the Azure functions to do a variety of things, such as perhaps managing a set of PDF files in SharePoint to do some clever uh, things around that and building that securely. So he'll be touching on a variety of things uh, and hope, you know, help you to get started if you're new to it uh, or for, for those who are already working with SharePoint development. 
And then obviously uh, some more tips there as well from him. But yeah, without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Joel Rodriguez and uh, uh, over to you, Joel. Hello everyone and thanks Chirag. Uh, and before I started, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I'm sure it's no surprise to everyone, but a big thank you for you to organizing this and for the time you put into this, uh, like spending half an hour every now and then trying to get people to connect. I'm not saying it happened with someone like me, but you know, it could have happened like yesterday. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thanks for that. Uh, so let me share my screen. Okay, so as uh, Shirag already mentioned, uh, the session is around connecting to SharePoint from an Azure function. Uh, it doesn't need to be an Azure function, but this is just the example uh, I'm using for the demo. Uh, using PNP PowerShell with a, an app registration and a certificate. Um, so my name is Joel Rodrigues. I'm a SharePoint developer uh, at Storm Technology. I also work as a contractor to with other clients. Uh, I don't do only SharePoint development. Of course, we end up doing pretty much, up, I guess, every SharePoint developer will end up doing uh, M365 development. Uh, things are very uh, wide at the moment. Uh, Microsoft MVP in Office development. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at Joel FM Rodriguez or LinkedIn, or which I didn't put the link, but it's pretty much the same. Uh, and uh, follow my blog if you find any content there that's interesting to you, just m365-dev.com. Um, so some scenarios that involve the session that I'm going to show you. Um, of course, we are going to connect to SharePoint, which typically was not often doing done with, uh, was very commonly done with client ID and secrets in the past. Um, how the trigger of the functions are affected once you have the function fully secured. Uh, and this is done via a queue, which I just put a mention there, but in reality, I'm not even covering that scenario because it will just work, nothing will change. But then all the impact that you will have to consider when you secure your functions and you close uh, every door to make things secure and how you still consume your function from other applications uh, without having a big problem. And it really is easy. Uh, there really is no reason to sacrifice security. There is a big hot topic at the moment, and uh, there is a reason for that. So don't start building uh, functions and uh, not making them secure by default, and because down the line that will create you problems. Uh, so how do we connect uh, to the Azure function? So we have our Azure function uh, being triggered. The Azure function, and this is basically the scenario I'm going to show you. The Azure function will request uh, secrets and a certificate or the app ID and a certificate from Key Vault where they will be securely stored. Um, the function will actually access that data using managed identity. So it's the function itself who is accessing the data, not the user or a user account or anything. Uh, the key vault validates the access, everything is good, returns the data back, and the Azure function establishes a connection to SharePoint. Um, this is then, of course, with an uh, app-only scenario where we use an Azure AD uh, application, uh, which we are going to create as well. Uh, the, the command to connect, uh, if you are familiar with PNP PowerShell, I'm sure you used it countless times. If you never used PNP PowerShell, uh, it's a simple command uh, from the PNP PowerShell module uh, where you just pass the URL of the site you are connecting to, uh, the client ID of your app, the tenant, 
and the Base64 encoded certificate. Uh, and this, I promise you, is easier than you may think. Uh, so let's have a quick demo. Uh, and on the demo, we will cover the Azure AD application. So from creation, validating that everything is correctly configured, which will be by default. Um, we'll create a key vault, uh, add a secret, add a certificate to the key vault, configure the access policies. Uh, we need an Azure function as well to test the, the code. Uh, we will enable manage identity, configure some app settings, and then enable the authentication. Um, oops, I need to go to the demo. So let me start by creating an Azure AD application. So I have uh, my Azure portal, and I go to Active Directory and go to App Registrations. I could create the application here, and I will have to go and to grant it API permissions. I have to enable the authentication flows, uh, add a certificate. I will have to, before that, create a certificate myself. But there is a command in PNP called Register PNP Azure AD App, which handles pretty much all of that. So let me do this. So let's start by connecting to my tenant and just note that I'm connecting to the admin portal and not to the root site, for instance. Uh, you won't ask me for credentials because I have them cached. Uh, next thing is we are going to need a password for the certificate. So we are creating a self-signed certificate. By default, you will have something like 10 years uh, to expire. Uh, and you will, if you don't specify uh, the properties, you will be just good to go, but you can uh, refine uh, some of the certificate properties as needed. Uh, so in this case, I'm just converting a string which is my certificate password, super safe pass one, two, three, converted to secure string. And now I'm just going to create the Azure AD app. So this is the command I have to use. I give it an application name, uh, M36, M365 UK user group. That's my tenant, my password as a secure string. Uh, the out path is the folder, which is where I am now. Uh, I, I just use the, local, the current folder where the command will uh, place the certificate file that it creates. Uh, and the, that's just a login type. So we press go and immediately it tries to authenticate and it gives me a code which is already in my clipboard so I, on this window i simply have to go next log in with my account and close the window so now the so powershell is creating the app registration and doing all the configuration so all i have to do is wait a moment this process will also ask me to grant to consent the permissions on the app uh, of course if you are trying to do this in production uh, and you don't have an admin account then you won't be able to complete that step uh, just account for that but everything that we are we have done here can be done also manually uh, when you go to i'll just pick a random app uh, all you need to create to is create an app, uh, ensure that the authentication is configured, uh, set up the required permissions, and so on. So let's. This should be completed soon. Okay, so now he's asking me to log in again to grant the API permissions. So 
we can specify when creating the app the permissions that we are requesting. I did not specify anything, so it's trying to request some high level permissions uh, for SharePoint, uh, access to user profiles, groups. I'm assuming that they just try to cover some common scenarios there, but you are completely free to specify the permissions your app will require. So it's created. I output the certificate here. As you can see on my file system, it also uploads the two files just now, actually two minutes ago. Um, and if we now refresh our app, that's the app we created, and we can completely ensure that everything is configured. That's turned on. We have our certificate already uploaded to the app, and we have our permissions already granted, uh, the admin consent granted. So everything is ready to go, and we don't need to do anything here. So the next step is I have an Azure resource group completely empty here, and I'm going to create a key vault. So we are going to store all the sensitive information on the key vault. So our Azure function never exposes any information. This is also good if uh, you are working with big organizations. Often they have different people that can access the key vaults and different people who can access the functions. Uh, so that way, by not storing anything in app settings that is confidential, uh, you keep everything quite secure. So let's go to our key vault. We are going to create oops, a new secret, and I'm going to call it authentication ID, and this will be my client ID. I just call it auth ID because that's a generic naming I, I often use because depending on, I may not be connecting uh, with an app ID, for example. So I always use the same name. It doesn't really matter what's inside. So I have my app ID there, and I need a certificate. So on the certificates, we just click Generate Import. I could generate a new one, but I'm going to use the one that the command imported. And on my file, it's there, PFX. Uh, so make sure you select that and the password. And here it doesn't really matter. Okay, so we have our certificate. So back to the app, you can see it's exactly the same temp print there. Um, the next thing we also need to do on the key vault is ensure that the function can access it. But we, for that, we, are, we need to go first and create a function. Oops, resource group there. Create. We want a function app. Uh, I forgot the name I gave to the other one, but I think it was or maybe not. So I just need to. 
I like to keep the names consistent. <laughs> uh, so let's go with PowerShell core as the runtime stack, seven. And I think I picked UK West for the other one. So create, I'm not going to bother with anything like tags or so on. So I'm while I'm creating this through the UI, on an ideal scenario, everything that I'm going to show you here can be fully automated with ARM templates and scripts. Uh, so everything I'm, all the setup I'm doing here, I have it all uh, configured on templates and um, scripts uh, on a base solution, which I just ran. Takes like 15 minutes to deploy everything. And uh, from that point, I have a function completely configured with the uh, keys on the and secrets. Sorry, not secrets and the certificates already on the key vault. The app settings already configured, authentication and so on. So all that can be done uh, is the some effort to do it the first time, but after that is a massive time saver, and uh, you guarantee that all the um, configurations are in place on every single project you do. So it's definitely a thing I recommend if you're working with functions often to invest some time on that. So we have our own function. In order to give the function access to the key vault, we need to create an identity for the function. So when we go on this identity section, and that's so extremely simple, we just turn it on and we save. Is a system assigned identity and what is does let's wait for this to finish. Joel, can I interrupt for a second? Yes. Uh, we have a question just thought I quickly ask uh, because you're in this stage. Um, can the managed identity itself be given access to SharePoint? Uh, no. I 90 99% sure that will not work because of the SharePoint APIs. Sure. OK, thank you. Uh, but it should be able to work if you are requesting. So if you are accessing Graph, I believe you can do it. Uh, okay. But not SharePoint as far as I know. I already looked into that in the past. Uh, that's a good question. Though. Thank you. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so we are on back on the key vault uh, access policies section. Just refreshing that and now uh, because I created the key vault, I already have full access to pretty much everything. But we don't want that because we are building a safe um, setup. So let me, on the principle, let me select my function. And it was that one. So this is the function I created just a moment ago. Select. And I want it to be able to retrieve certificates only, nothing more than that, and secrets. So you will be able to get basically read certificates and secrets and won't be able to do anything else. So you can see here we only have one permission for the function, that's it. Uh, so our key vault is fully configured now. Uh, it should allow the function to request data. So we we, we are going to have a Azure function in PowerShell and uh, uh, everything that's configurable should just go on app settings or key vault if it's uh, sensitive information. Uh, in the past, long time ago, uh, that this is available for some time, we used to have to go and retrieve data from Key Vault in order to use it. Um, later, Microsoft introduced the capability to use Key Vault references in app settings. So, what this means is I can create an app setting that tells Azure that I need it, a value from Key Vault and it will go and get it from me when I try to get the app setting value. That way I avoid having to code my application 
uh, in a way that he needs to be aware of Key Vault. My application doesn't even need to know that Key Vault is there. Um, and everything just happens behind the scenes. So if I go and create a new app setting, just give it the same name, app ID, and just copying an example from here. Setting will look something like that. So at Microsoft.keyvault, and then the secret URI, which is not, of course, this one, and we are going to get from my key vault. Uh, there is also another option where instead of secret URI, you can specify the key vault name and the, the secret name. Um, it's just do the way you prefer, really. Uh, so if we now go to our secrets and I click on my out ID, I need to click on the version of the secret. There will be more listed here, but I, I just want the latest one, and then I copy the secret identifier and paste it here. Uh, so this is the version of the secret. So if you have multiple versions, imagine you change the app ID to something else. You can target specific versions of the secret like that, or you can target a secret like that without specifying the version and they will just get the latest. It doesn't really matter. Uh, just think of that when you're doing it, it may be important for how your case or what your app is intended to do or how you intend to maintain it in the future. So the next thing is we are going to add another app setting, which is the certificate. And again, this is a key vault reference to my certificate. So, and where do I get this? I need to open the certificate version, scroll right to the bottom, and there again, there is the identifier here. So copy that and replace it and we are ready to go. Uh, so what I will also need because of the um, sorry one second. No. Yeah, because we are playing with certificates, there is also another setting I need to have. And the name is not may not sound very related. Uh, but this is to allow the function to handle the certificates. So website load user profile with value one. Uh, I save that. Of course, you could add more keys here. So for example, I will I will be connecting to the tenant using uh, the command I showed before, which has a tenant parameter, you could also add it as an app setting here, but that's just a text configuration. I, I'll just hard code it for the demo. Um, that's it. Now, one thing we need to do is where is the app files? I'm going to modify some app files here only because we're not creating a solution from VS Code or Visual Studio and publishing it to Azure. We are just doing everything in the portal for simplicity. So I am going to make some changes which generally will be done in your solution. So on the profile, I will comment out this. So what is happening here is Azure is trying, the function is trying to establish a connection um, for the PowerShell, Azure PowerShell module using the identity of the function. We don't need that because I'm not retrieving. We would need this if I, we were going to retrieve the certificates for Key Vault ourselves in code, but we're not doing that. Azure is doing that for us, so I don't need any of that. Save this. And the next thing is on the requirements. 
So you can see that a Azure PowerShell is already commented out. If not, you will need to comment that. And we are having PNP PowerShell. So I'm test adding here the latest stable version 160. I will believe it will work because my last time I tried was 150, but it should work. <laughs> if the demo fails, I will just switch back one version, but should be fine. So remember, this is under requirements. File, if you create a solution from Visual Studio, you will have these files there where you can just make the changes. What this does is every time the function runs or when the function runs, it will just load the PNP PowerShell module for you. Um, if you use uh, the older version of the PNP PowerShell module, uh, there was no way to install it like that. Uh, there was some guidance on how to upload the entire module to the file system of the function, uh, which obviously worked, but this is a much cleaner approach and uh, just really please they do this. Um, so that's the configuration of the function that we need to do. And now let's create our function. So we go add function HTTP trigger. Okay, and we have our function there. If we go to code and test, we can test it and run. I can see the function is executing this is the first time we are running it, so it's installing the PNP PowerShell module. It may take uh, just one or two minutes. It's generally quick. Uh, and this will only happen uh, when the function restarts or uh, re something like that. So it, on normal executions, you will not have to install the function every time. Okay. And we are service and available. Why? Okay, there you go. It was probably still uh, installing the module. So we can query our function. So let's now make our call to SharePoint. Let me just do it, just do it here. And what we need for this is just some variables. Uh, I just have the site URL for one of my sites. Uh, for the app ID, which is our uh, app setting, which is connected to Key Vault, I just do the same as if I was retrieving an app setting, just getting it from the environmental uh, environment variable. Uh, the tenant I'm connecting to, and the, exactly the same for the certificate. And that's really it. So next thing, we have our connect command. We specify the URL, just pass client ID tenant and the base64 encoded certificate. So when you request the certificate from Key Vault using the identifier, it is already base64 encoded. And uh, you cannot see here, but there is a password parameter for the password of the certificate, which you could specify here, but in this case, it's also there already. You don't need the password. So simply that. If you compare this with a normal connect command, you may be doing using a client ID in secret. Client ID, tenant, 
and this is pretty much your secret. That's that's it. That's almost the same. And we can test it by just creating the list on the site. So now if I save that. And run a test. We can get back all the lists that I have on the site. So in terms of permissions, this works because my application under API permissions has enough SharePoint permissions to do that. In this case, full control. Uh, so be aware of that when you do it. Uh, just make sure you always have enough permissions on your app to do what you need. Ideally, just the minimum amount. Uh, and also, one other thing is, sorry, I, okay. We can test our function from here because it's anonymous. So everyone, we have all this stuff in place uh, for certificates and so on, but our function is anonymous by default when I create it. So what really happens when, oops, my bad. Second, I don't know what happened there. So when you create a function, what security does it really have already in place? And and who can access, who has access to control that and all those things is one thing you should consider if you never thought about that, because all the functions are public, yes, publicly accessible, anonymous by default. Um, and you really need to close the door. So that's everyone going inside your function. That's basically what happens when someone requests the URL of your function. There is nothing to keep them away. Uh, when you copy that URL, we can do a quick test there. So this is a function URL there. If I go on private window. Sorry, Joel, I think we've lost one of your screens there. I think I'm seeing your PowerPoint presenter presenter view. Oh, OK, I'm not presenting anymore. Uh, let me stop and start again one second. Thank you for that. No problem. Can you see the browser now? Yes, all good. Thank you. Thank you. So when we paste the URL on a browser, we can see that the function is actually executing. I'm getting into the function. Simply as that. Uh, if we now go back to our function, one thing we always need to do is enable authentication. So add an identity provider. Microsoft made this extremely easy. Uh, I'm just going with Azure AD. I'm going to use the app registration, which I created before. So on the first step of the demo, I will require authentication and I will just treat this as an API and show a 401 page. If we now enable that, we can go back to our function. So if I am logged in, well, in this case, I'm not logged in, so you can see straight away that my request is not had permissions, so the function rejected it. So 
Sorry, one second. Um, so how do we now consume this function from a third party application? Uh, common scenarios that we use for um, SharePoint and M365 in general is from SharePoint framework projects, from another function, which could be C Sharp, PowerShell, or a web application, uh, or for Power Automate or Logic Apps. Those are probably the most common scenarios we use. Um, while the function will work as a normal with a simple request before, that won't be the case now. Um, but while that may sound a bit too much effort to deal with, it's extremely simple on pretty much all of the cases that I mentioned. So I'm not going to click present just in case this goes wrong again, but this is an example on how to consume a function with authentication from SharePoint Framework. Um, you declare the headers and you can pass it. If you use a post request, you can just pass it some body information. You use the get client from the AAD HTTP client factory and AAD stands for Azure Active Directory. So the framework already has um, a client that handles the authentication for you. Oops. Uh, and then you post, you do a post request to the API endpoint and pass it um, the options you configured before. If behind the scenes, all you need to do is ensure that your solution, uh, your SPFX solution is configured uh, with access to the API. There is a config file where you just need to include uh, a very small configuration snippet. There is documentation for that, of course. I don't know if I have it on the resources here. I may have it here. Um, and that, that really is all you need. So pretty much the same as doing a simple request, the part that you use the AAD HTTP client instead of the simple HTTP client. From Power Automate or a Logic App, and I'm, I can show you this one, we have enough time. Um, you have to make sure you configure the authentication scenario. Uh, sorry, the authentication section. From uh, C Sharp or PowerShell, you can use the MSA library. Uh, and also for, for C Sharp and also for PowerShell as well. And the same for JavaScript. Of course, if you're not using SharePoint Framework and you're just using um, JavaScript uh, application, uh, you can just use it as well. So the Microsoft Identity um, Authentication Library, sorry. So let's try to now cover this. Let me create a flow. Uh, schedule. Okay. Just make sure it doesn't run. And let's Execute an HTTP action. Oh, sorry, that is a premium. Okay, forgot about that. Let's go to the logic app where everything is cheaper. <laughs> sorry, this is my key vault. I don't need that. So what you will see here is exactly the same as flow. So just creating logic up. Should 
if I'm to finish in the next five minutes. Uh, so if you never use logic apps, that's same as a flow, really. Uh, some important differences, of course, but in here we don't have uh, premium connectors uh, in the same way that you have in flow. So let's do a post request to my function. A get actually. My function URI, which I can get. Functions. So just know that this function URI contains the code to be able to access the function. Um, and now on the authentication. Uh, Active directory auth. On the authority, I need to use that's always the same URL on the tenant. tenant. And now the audience and the client ID are the same in this case, which is only it's my application ID that I created initially. Same here. And there is a certificate or a secret. Just be aware that the case here is different. Um, and I'm going to connect with a secret. So if I go to my app, let me just quickly create a new secret. Matter. Let's save that. Make sure we do this again. So if I clear the logs and run again. Of course, what I did here, I just start coded everything into the HTTP action. Ideally, you also want to go to Key Vault and retrieve from there everything that is uh, confidential, like the secret or if you you can see here the function executed, but ideally you also want to put this information on key vault or I actually never try to connect to, with a certificate to the function, but I don't see why it wouldn't work as well. Uh, so we already had this on the key vault anyway. Uh, make sure you get the secret there if you're doing something like that. Uh, that's really it. Uh, there are some resources here that I have. Uh, so as I mentioned previously, I, if you're working with functions, make sure you do all of these, uh, make things secure by default. And if possible, if you work with functions enough to justify the effort, and it, trust me, you won't take that long. You can do all of these via uh, ARM template for deployment of the Azure resources. And then uh, if you you can orchestrate that with, for example, PowerShell or or just do it in a different way if you prefer. I, that's the way I did it. Uh, but everything is configurable via the APIs uh, or templates. So you can have a function fully configured in something like 15 minutes. And all you have to do is put your code there and it will work. Uh, you can just default to something like a naming convention for um, app settings and key, key vault um, 
keys and secrets, and then everything will just work. Uh, I can also share the slides. Um, I also have some resources here with some information. Um, and that's really it. Uh, are there any questions? Let me try to check. Uh, so, there was a question, and sorry, I'm only reading them now. Uh, Go for it. Is it generating a self-signed certificate? Yes. Uh, one thing to be aware, I think I mentioned uh, it is a self-signed certificate that is generated by PNP PowerShell script. Okay, cool. So uh, Russell Grove just asked a question on the performance between C-sharp and PowerShell. Um, they are different. Uh, <laughs> I also use C-sharp sometimes, depending on what you're doing. So if I'm only doing something basic that needs to connect to SharePoint, do a very simple operation that may be completely supported by one or two commands in PowerShell, which is very often the case, or a very few manipulation of data. Sometimes I just personally, I just think PowerShell is a lot easier in those scenarios because you end up with like your function will have, I don't know, 10 lines of code or something that like that. It's for maintaining the, you, the effort is pretty much zero. Uh, of course, if you use a very complex application, you that's up to you to consider C sharp or PowerShell in terms of performance. PowerShell probably a bit slower. I'm not fully sure because it's a wrapper of the C sharp um, PNP library. Uh, so it may be a little bit slower, but I would not expect it to be significant. I may be wrong. I never actually compared similar scenarios. If someone has any information, I'm more than happy to also get some feedback there. OK, thank you very much. If someone has any questions, I will try to stick around till the end. So feel free to drop them, drop them in the chat. Thanks, Joel. We've got just one more question, if that's all right, uh, from Ariel Crow. Mm -hmm. uh, what about consuming the Azure function from a Logic app using the Azure function connector? Will that have issues if you configure authentication on the function? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't, I haven't explored that scenario, but I assume, I'm assuming, uh, well, I won't look at this now because it will take me longer and we are over time. Um, yeah, no, but no, no. Uh, I actually haven't uh, tested that, but I assume it will, it should work the same. Okay, that's fine. That's okay, no, uh, good. Um, so yeah, listen, I think, um, you know, thanks very much for, uh, for tuning in today, really, um, and you know your time and effort to put this uh, great session and the presentation demos together, and I uh, really appreciate. Obviously, it does take a lot of effort uh, in doing so. Uh, right. Okay. So welcome back, everyone, and uh, uh, firstly, thanks to Joel Rodriguez earlier who uh, delivered a great session to. Uh, to M365 UK attendees around the security connection uh, to SharePoint Online uh, from Azure Functions. So uh, uh, that was a great session and the recording will be available on Friday, uh, but I'm delighted to welcome uh, as well uh, Zoe Wilson and uh, Luke Evans, uh, who's gonna be presenting uh, us with the Microsoft Teams uh, usability versus security. So pretty much uh, since the kind of the pandemic that's happened and we all know the familiar stories around the adoption of uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, so yeah, really great session to look forward to and uh, a bit about the speakers really. I mean, Zoe uh, and Luke, I've known them for quite a few years now and uh, especially Zoe who speaks at a lot of community events uh, and not just in the Microsoft uh, related tech, but also elsewhere in other parts of the community. Uh, inspiring the young women, uh, so you know to to basically uh, bring them to the tech career. So um, great to have you, Zoe, and uh, also Luke. Uh, great to have you as well. Uh, Luke has been uh, you know like former Microsofty. Uh, great experience uh, between the two of them. They you know, they bring 30 years of experience 
uh, in the Microsoft tech. So uh, uh, sit back and relax and uh, really, uh, yeah, welcome to you both. So uh, take it away, Zoe. Cool. Awesome, Please. thank you. You got the slides ready to roll? Let's rock and roll. Just let me know when you can see them and we should be good. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Luke. Uh, so first of all, thanks everybody uh, for joining us and thanks Shirak for having us. Um, we're here today to talk to you about Microsoft Teams and the balance between usability and security. Uh, but before we get into the content, we'll go to Luke first of all to do a, a quick intro to himself. Hey, hey, hey. We got Luke Evans here. So I, I'm a technical architect uh, at Julisus at the moment. I have about 15 years, like Shirag very kindly pointed out. Thank you for for calling out how long I've been in the game, Shrag. Um, <laughs> what I would say is, I for my for my sins, I did do six years at Microsoft in SharePoint in, in support and pre-sales. So I, I come from a SharePoint background, a collaborative kind of background. But since then, I've kind of been more shifted to kind of the, the 365 side, specifically around security and identity are probably the key pieces for me. So a lot of stuff that I'll talk about today typically has a focus on that. And, uh, you know, I, I've worked for a, a number of different clients over the years and, and range from you know a couple hundred users to a couple hundred thousand users so it just depends on kind of what it is but yeah that, that's a very brief bit about me brilliant all right thanks luke uh so my name's zoe i'm the director of innovation and customer success also at agilisys uh so i've worked with luke for the last what four years four now ye i think yeah four years um and the, I mean, the company we work for, we work predominantly with the UK public sector, but my background covers a lot more than that as well. Um, and my technical background is also in the content and collab workloads of Microsoft 365. So like Luke, I've worked with SharePoint probably for more than 15 years now. Um, I've worked with Teams since it was first launched more than four years ago. Um, and I've also got a few years experience of growing and building out large, high performing technical teams. Uh, like Shireg said, I speak at loads of events. Um, mostly online recently for obvious reasons, but I've done in-person ones as well back when we we're allowed. Um, I'll, I'm going to be at South Coast Summit later this year, um, hopefully with Shirag and Luke as well. Mm -hmm. um, Luke and I are also presenting at Commsverse uh, and I'm part of the organising team for the Scottish Summit as well. So it's really great to see that there's lots of in-person events coming back. But, um, you know, I love virtual events like this as well because uh, it's, I mean, it's easy, isn't it? It's an easy way to stay connected with everybody. Uh, now I'm incredibly, I've not finished yet Luke. Oh sorry am, Zoe, my bad. Still going, yeah. So I am, <laughs> I'm incredibly passionate about accessibility and, and one of the things that I do like to talk about with Teams as well is accessibility features, uh, to, uh, not just with Teams but across the whole of at Microsoft 365. Um, what else do I do? So I've recently started working as a, an enterprise careers advisor. So I work with a school in my area and I'm helping them with their career strategy, hoping to hopefully get more people into tech careers. Um, I'm part of the Women in Teams community and I'm generally active across the wider uh, Microsoft community as well. Um, I'm also in a really good mood today because yesterday was my 40th birthday and I had to get up really early this morning and took my driving test and passed. Um, so I'm hoping that we're going to have a lot of fun with this. Uh, now you can move on. All right. Thanks, Zoe. Oh, gosh. Hold on. Give me a second. All right. There we go, bingo. Brilliant, all right, thank you. Um, okay, so this is the agenda we're going to cover with you today. Um, and what I would say before we dive in is that this is, it's not brand new content, but it is relatively new content that we're pulling together. So um, forgive us if you know there's a little bit of kind of rusty handovers and things like that, but we, we hope you enjoy it. We look forward to any questions and please do give us feedback at the end as well, uh, because that's what helps make, make these things better. So we're going to start off first of all by looking at Teams today, uh, some of the key um, use cases or some of the key things that I want from Teams as an end user. Uh, we'll then look at where the responsibilities lie for security. So whose responsibility is it actually? Is it ours? Is it Microsoft's? Uh, and then I'm going to hand the baton over to Luke and he's going to walk us through some of the technical components that are available from a security perspective and how they keep our end users safe. And then we'll finish off with a bit of a summary recommendations um, and any questions that you pop in through the Q&A will we'll, we'll come to those at the end as well. So moving on then, so having uh, let's have a look at Teams today. Now, as I said in my intro, this has only been around for just over four years and um, the growth that we've seen has been absolutely exponential. Um, 
I think it was April when the stats came out. They they said that Teams has reached 145 million daily active users, which is just absolutely staggering. Um, 30% of companies use Teams for remote work during the COVID-19 pandemic. And actually, um, Microsoft added 95 million users last year because it became one of the most popular apps during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, it also grew faster than Zoom as well. And the number of teams and the number of organisations who are using Teams now um, has also in increased exponentially. I mean, the number we've got there, 500,000, I'm sure it has to be way, way higher than that now. And um, if we move on to the next one, so um, I think when we when we talk about security and usability, I think historically, um, often effective security came at the expense of usability. So what that meant is that you know the configurations that were put in place and the controls that like infosec or ig or it put in place were generally so restrictive that it made it harder for people to do their job. Uh, and likewise, usability came at the expense of security. So if people wanted to actually be able to use the tools in the, the way they were intended, it wasn't possible to allow that in a way that actually kept them safe. And one of the things that I often see when I, you know, when I talk to customers or people across the community is, is this notion that there isn't a way that you can actually achieve both effective security and usability simultaneously, simultaneously that it just doesn't work. And if you look at this image, where we want to be is in that green box on the top right. We want high security, so we want our users to be safe, but we also want that improved usability as well. And I think what what we've seen over the last year is that a lot of organisations are actually in the improved usability box, but they've got low security um, because they just threw teams out to help uh, people work remotely without actually thinking about it. And I mean, it's, it's a conversation even now, you know, more than a year after we've gone into lockdown, it's still a conversation that I'm having regularly with people where, um, you know, they did, they, they, they got to like March, April last year and just went sod it, let's switch it on, let's give it, give it to everybody. And it's only now 15 months later that actually they're starting to understand the ramifications of that and the problems that it, that it could potentially cause them. So if we if we move forward again then, so as a user, what are the types of use cases that I have? I think a pretty convincing one actually that the last year has shown us is that end users need to be able to work from anywhere. And actually it's not just about working from anywhere, it's also about working on any device as well. When the whole world shifted to remote work, we saw a few things happen. And some of these things are actually just that, you know, they're getting worse. I mean, um, you know, we saw huge device shortages worldwide. So people were having to connect to office apps using things, uh, connect to office apps like Teams using things like mobiles or tablets or old laptops. And actually, um, you know, I, I've, I saw something only last week that said, that, you know, for corporate laptop supply, there's like a an expected two year wait list because the demand is just so high that the supply cannot cannot meet it. And, you know, we've got the chip shortages which are compounding this. So that ability, that requirement to be able to access these tools on any device is just going to increase as we look to kind of the next, you know, six, six to 24 months. Um, as an end user, I also need to be confident as a user that only the right people have access to my content so that I can collaborate and work with them safely and securely. Um, and it doesn't matter whether these are my internal colleagues in an internal team or whether it's external partners in an external facing team. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's me working and collaborating with someone in a Teams meeting or a chat or whether they're invited into a team as a fully fledged guest in my AD environment. And um, when we think that as a user, I also need to be able to collaborate securely with other organisations. So what this means is that I need my IT admins to have set up all of the right configuration and controls to allow for me to do work with external people securely. And actually, as an end user, 
I, I don't know what these are. You know, I'm just, um, you know, I'm John Smith of Working Finance. Um, I, I don't know what the right controls are. What I need is to be able to trust that I can put a request in for an external team and that all of this is just going to have been thought about for me. So that if I work in this space with these people, the, the, the you know, the right kind of rules and config are already going to be there for me. Mm-hmm. And I guess following on from this, lastly, when I think about my data, so the things that I'm putting into Teams, it also needs to be protected. And ideally, it needs to be protected for me. So a typical end user isn't a records manager. I don't know what different retention rules or sensitivity controls apply to the stuff I'm working on. Ideally, I just want, again, I just want to be able to work in the right team with my colleagues or, or you know, partners or whoever they are and automatically have my data looked after for me. Um, Luke, I mean, is there, you know, any flip side admin thoughts you want to add on to that one? I think for me, I think when we're talking, thinking, thinking about this sort of stuff, I think that the key things are from an admin perspective. So say I'm, I'm running the show here. I need to ensure if I'm giving access to my users, you know, how do I ensure governance across that whole estate? How do I kind of enable self-service and allow users to get on with their job? And kind of how do I manage this at scale, which is kind of the governance piece again. But say we're opening up all this access for users, how can we ensure that when they are working remotely, we can still have that kind of corporate level of governance over what they're doing, that oversight? So I think it's one of the ones that you usually say, Zoe, is kind of governance on, on guide rails is the one that you, you usually pitch, but that's kind of the, the admin piece that I would look at as the one, is how we want to support our users in doing this, but we want to make sure that it, it's secure again, and we can also manage and, and kind of maintain that in an ongoing kind of basis is the key. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the point about governance guardrails is is right. Um, you know, we've all seen the guardrails that you get when you go bowling and you don't know what you're doing. Ideally, what you want is, is guardrails around everything that you do with these corporate systems that keep you safe, even if you don't understand what the different configuration is. Uh, Right, OK, so let's move on then and have a look at responsibilities. So when we talk about um, security for things like this, whose responsibility is it? And, um, you know, I've got a, an analogy. It's actually Luke's analogy, so I'll give him credit for it. But if, if you think about this, so you're, you're driving on a long, dark road on a rainy night. And if you're driving, this is quite relevant because I've just passed my test, isn't it? <laughs> this isn't going to be me, by the way. But <laughs> if you're driving 20 miles over the speed limit and you fail to hit the brakes when the car in front of you comes to a sudden stop, is it your fault? Or is it your car manufacturer's fault if you rear end the car in front of you? Now, when we drive, we just seamlessly understand that there are some things that we depend on the manufacturer to provide for us. So things like brakes that work, airbags that deploy. And then there are some things that we're responsible for to keep us safe. So things like using the brakes when you need to or not turning off the airbag protection. And um, I think this is a, a really interesting way to look at it when we think about this, you know, this whole um, usability versus security angle and, and whose responsibility is it to keep it safe. Um, when customers are leveraging only on-prem IT, they have complete responsibility, or if you're the IT admin, you have complete responsibility to protect the data and to implement all of the necessary controls and tools and, and apps, firewalls, whatever it is, it, you know, it's your responsibility to make sure that you're protecting that data and that you're configuring everything in a way that keeps you compliant with regulatory standards. And when data's moved into cloud services like Microsoft 365 and Microsoft Teams, that burden is reduced and sometimes it's reduced by quite a lot because the cloud represents a shared responsibility between the customer and the cloud service provider. So, for example, if you're using software as a service like Microsoft 365, Microsoft does help you take care of, the, of a lot of the controls, including things like physical infrastructure and networking so that, you know, you might not need to spend resources building out your own data center or setting up network controls. But actually, you shouldn't lose sight of the fact that if you just take what Microsoft give you and run with it, you've essentially left a whole heap of, gra- of, of gaping holes in your environment that needs to be dealt with. 
Um, Luke, is there anything that you want to add on to this before you uh, take over with some of the, the tech that can actually help with this? Sure. So the parts that I would like to call out specifically here in terms of the Microsoft 365 piece, if we look at the top right, so we're really looking at the blue cubes of the important ones, so customer management of risk or shared management of risk. And although, like Zoe said, we have kind of the network controls, the host infrastructure, that physical security taken care of, the key areas that we really need to focus on from a technical standpoint is really the data classification and accountability, which is fully our responsibility. So what you store in Microsoft 365, that's what we need to look at. We need to look at halfway client and endpoint protection. And also the other key one for me, and this is one of my favorites, is identity and access management and kind of actually ha Microsoft will provide the underlying infrastructure for that, so Azure AD, but we are the gatekeepers of kind of who has access to that. We need to control that and, and how we do that. So Microsoft in these areas are, are willing to support you and I will talk through kind of how I'd recommend we do it and, and kind of what tools and technologies we can use to better secure these kind of blocks. But this, this one's really just helping to kind of highlight and you know it's not 100 percent taken care of you can't lose sight of you know your responsibility here from a, a technical standpoint just by moving to microsoft 365 all your problems are not resolved is the important thing here now over to me thanks for that zoe that was wonderful actually that was really good so um certainly the car analogy really did it really set the scene certainly with you passing today i think for me before we look at kind of uh, securing anything in, in terms of how we can better secure teams while still keeping it usable we want to kind of understand first and foremost what is what is it that we're trying to secure typically so i i typically approach things with the who what why when where kind of mindset and for me you know i i know who i'm securing it for i'm securing it for my users when kind of as soon as possible obviously the why is kind of covered previously we want to make sure the the, the use cases but the what are we securing is probably a, a bit more interesting in my opinion so when we're looking at Microsoft Teams, we're not, it's a whole kind of aggregation of services that make it up is the important thing. We've got here, you know, this is the high level architecture of Microsoft Teams. So this one's been going around for a while, but quite a few people don't understand the, 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 the breadth and depth of components that make up Microsoft Teams. And I think the key thing here that we're looking at is you've got a whole bunch of things in terms of graph. We've got Azure AD, we've got OneDrive, we've got SharePoint, we've got Exchange. We've got OneNote, we've got web app companions, we've got the Skype public facing services, we have Stream and we have Exchange as well on the side in the bottom right. Now, when we're talking about securing teams, we're not talking about just securing teams. We're securing kind of all the different components that come together and with a focus on the, the shared responsibility box that we saw in the previous slide. So the things that we're really looking at are kind of identity and access management. We're looking at client and endpoint and we're also looking at the kind of data management. And in the next couple of slides, I'll run you through some of the technical components that I would typically look at when we're trying to secure Microsoft Teams and some recommendations around them. So a brief explanation of what we do or what it does and probably kind of the, the key thing is what I would do if you have that technology available to you. So I'll give you some recommendations around how I configure it and better secure your users when using Teams. Now, before I get going on the technical components, what I would typically say is at heart, I'm a techie. I, I tend to talk quite quickly on, on topics that I enjoy or am enthusiastic about. So if I go too quickly or if I miss something or if there's an additional question you might have, please feel free to stick it in the Q&A and Sharad can have a look and, and get it across to me. I, I would rather have it kind of more interactive and you guys quiz me on different areas. If you guys don't want, that's fine. Zoe is also going to quiz me along the way and, and run through kind of some of the technical components and you know, with a, a usability slant on in terms of different questions and how that might work. Now, one of my favorite technologies that we can use uh, and to immediately better secure kind of your users are typically around the Azure AD space. Now, a lot of these are gated behind different license, license ones, so I will probably call them out when you see, but you can get most of this basically in, in a baseline configuration kind of from day one without any special kind of licensing implications. Now, what is conditional access, you ask? It's kind of the who, what, why, when, where of how you can access your data is really the key thing, or your Microsoft 365 service or apps is the key. So what we're looking at here really is how does this work? So the, the key thing is a user, they want to access Teams from whatever device they wanted. And so like Zoe said in our usability slide, one of the use cases is I'm on the go, I want to access Teams, and say I'm on a mobile device, for example. What we're really looking at is the different conditions that allow or reject access to kind of our 365 services. 
and we can basically look at a user's location and this can be driven by the IP range or very recently they introduced the ability to use GPS. So on your mobile device or a, you know, a portable laptop, we can now use GPS to kind of track where people are in terms of how they access their data, which is which is awesome. We can use device state. So if you're using things like uh, Microsoft Intune or Endpoint Manager, we have the ability to, uh, and Defender for Endpoint, I should say, we have the ability to kind of look at a device state and what kind of risk profile that device is. So it may be that a device has got malware on, and in that case, the device state or the risk of that device will go up and we can basically uh, either allow or deny access based upon that. The other key one is a user group or type. So it might be you have a different policy for guests versus users, which is quite a common one, to be honest, in that we might want users that are based in the office not to be prompted for MFA, but we want guests who are accessing our data to always be prompted. And again, the risk one I kind of covered a minute ago, but typically that's going to be things like the sign-in risk of the device or the user, and, and we can look to see if a device is in a good known state, or it's kind of a risky sign-in, in which case we could block access to the tenancy. And or if we don't, if it's a good risk, we could allow access, we can enforce MFA. And if we want to get a bit more fancy, we can session control that using cloud app security. But I haven't got a slide on cloud app security, because it's a bit more fancy, but we can then start controlling things at the session level. So say I'm in OneDrive, we can start looking at how many files I'm downloading and we can say if they're on, uh, what would we say? If they're on a, a medium risk, we might not want them to download a large number of files so we can grant them access and allow that granularity. Now I'll come to my recommendations in a bit on conditional access and what I would get going with kind of immediately, but I have one more slide that I wanted to kind of layer into conditional access first. The next kind of piece of technology that I would look to use is typically identity protection. And, you know, Microsoft analyzes that they analyze over 6.5 trillion signals per day. And that's all the different authentications coming in from all the different services is the important thing. So, you know, live, Xbox Live, you've got your Microsoft accounts, you've got your Azure AD, you've got whatever service they have. They're basically all feeding into the same intelligence security graph. And basically this allows them signals to basically better understand and analyze what the risk of any given sign-in is. And these kind of, this risk level associated with these sign-ins can be basically, we can basically pump them into conditional access like we saw, or we can pump them into your SIEM tool such as Sentinel to ba basically trigger remediation or further investigation. Now, the things that identity protection is typically looking for is, you know, has this account been leaked in a, a recent dump on, you know, have I been pwned.com, uh, if they're, for, unfamiliar sign-in properties so it could look if you know if Luke's always using Firefox and he's always coming from a Windows 10 device and we suddenly see authentication from you know uh, he's suddenly using a MacBook and Safari is that an unfamiliar sign-in properties the other key one on that is a very related theme is a typical travel so again it may be that Luke is authenticating from the UK typically and he's suddenly authenticated from Nigeria is that that would obviously raise the risk profile of that sign-in Again, the other ones are kind of IP driven and that's more about anonymous IP address. So if you're coming from the Tor network or a VPN or this IP is associated with known malware, again, all these things contribute to the risk of that sign in. And it's not so much about the identity protection itself. It's what you do with that risk level that really makes it powerful. And the next one is kind of the risk based conditional access use case. And really what we're looking at here is kind of Again, it's a similar scenario. I'm accessing it from, uh, again, we could take any of the properties from the last one. So if we said, you know, the sign-in risk is too great because Luke's signing in from Nigeria, we could block his access and we can ask for a password reset is, is one option that we can do. Or if we are happy with that, we can allow and enforce MFA to basically prompt for a second level. And that's kind of where the risk-based conditional access use case comes in. Now, unfortunately, information protection and the risk-based kind of classification is locked behind. Azure AD Premium P2 and E5, but not to worry. I, I have some suggestions for people that don't have that available to them at this point in time. These are my kind of go-to tips on Azure AD conditional access recommendations. I think the first thing is, if you're not basically, if you haven't done anything with conditional access, the first thing you might want to do is just enable security defaults. And security, new, security defaults are basically enabled by default on new tenants, but it's basically a set of uh, conditional access rules and policies that come that are for people using the free version of Azure Active Directory. And basically it requires MFA for admin accounts, requires users to register for MFA and applies account protection. 
Now, the problem with security defaults are is that you can't really customize them. So you can't build kind of break glass emergency accounts. You can't kind of bespoke it to have different kind of conditions when you're using this technology. So if you have a slightly higher licensing level available to you, this is what I would recommend to kind of make it as easy as possible for you users while securing kind of your tenancy is the important thing. So the first one is an easy one, which is enable MFA, because basically 99.9% .9 of breaches can be prevented using MFA. The next one is disable legacy auth. So any of the legacy authentication protocols, we would typically look to block those. And that the reason is that it's the difference between an interactive sign-in and a non-interactive sign-in. So legacy auth is a non-interactive sign-in. And what that actually means is that it could just accept a username and password so people can try password spray attacks. The next one is allow a block countries is the one. So we can use network ranges and GPS like you saw in the previous slide a minute ago to basically control who can access our data. Now there's, there's kind of two schools of thoughts here that I would typically recommend. One is if you're in the UK and you only work in the UK, then you might just want to say I only allow traffic to my tenant from the UK and you cut out you know, every other country in the world. Now, again, you can use conditional access to say, I want to apply that to internal users and not guests. So again, you can further kind of make that slightly more specific. But again, that will really help cut down and, and secure kind of authentication access. The final one is device controls, and you can make it pretty seamless if you're using things like Intune. We can say, you know, this is a device that's joined to the domain, or this is an Azure AD joined domain. It's compliant with our corporate policies. And because of that, we're going to allow access so I've recently come up working from with a police force and, and they're looking to kind of use device driven controls. And I like them a lot because it, it means that you can have compliance over that device. Now, of course, this might not work in kind of the BYOD scenarios, but that's why we have the other rules on the left to kind of help supplement that is what I would say. Now, before you move on, Luke, um, well, then, you know, sorry. if we if we just think back to some of the, the use cases that we went through earlier for our end users, mm -hmm. um, everything that you've just went through sounds great. It makes tons of sense. But actually, you know, if I'm an end user, how is this going to help keep me safe? And, and more importantly, I think, how is this going to change my user experience? OK, that's a good question. And I think for the user, they the only th we want to make it as seamless as possible is what I would say. So. A lot of the time we would look for, you might want to, sorry, how would it, the two questions, I guess, are how would it make it more secure? I guess it would be more secure simply because we're not allowing users to basically, I guess, reuse credentials or have their credentials compromised is probably the best way of making it more secure. So we're, we're basically stopping compromised accounts. That's the security increase. Obviously, there's a trade off, and that's the usability perspective. And I think from that, you know, we want to try to make it as seamless as possible, but there is obviously going to be some change for users. So if we are enabling access on a BYOD device, we are definitely going to prompt for MFA. So they will have to go through that MFA registration piece. But to be honest, when you use the Microsoft Authenticator app, you can use notifications and passwordless authentication. It does become a lot easier. We, we also have the option of enabling SMS as an authentication method to, again, layer on additional kind of, I guess, make it more usable for, for end users, really. But I think the other thing to consider is if you make use of the device driven controls, you could you know drop the need for MFA if they're coming from a trusted device. In that sort of scenario, it would have no kind of meaningful impact on a user but it would be a lot more secure as you're only allowing access from those kind of control devices. Now, the next one I, I wanted to cover was a, very briefly was Azure, Azure AD access reviews. And basically Azure AD access reviews, basically you guys are familiar with Teams. I hope you guys are familiar with Office 365 groups. The common denominator in these is basically the O365 group, the Microsoft 365 group, and the members and ownership of that. And what we're really looking at here is if, again, it's an Azure AD Premium P2 feature, but the idea is to help understand kind of who is in a group, who should remain in a group, and basically have a continuous approves, approval and review cycle going on. And again, the really cool and powerful part of this is the system, so Azure AD can make recommendations based on usage in that group. So at the end of a review cycle, it could say, I want these people to basically I would suggest you remove these people and keep these people in the group. And what this is really doing is, is looking back to kind of Zoe's, I think, second use case, which is I want to ensure people only have access to what they need to. And what we really look and what I'd really suggest you guys look at for this one it is most likely the guest user reports is really the powerful piece one here. So we can set up access reviews on guest users and it can basically 
nominate who they think should stay and who should be removed. So Azure AD Access Review is very powerful, very cool stuff. And the, the system kind of suggestions is really the key for me on this one. Uh, I won't cover too much on this because I wanted to feed it into the next one, uh, uh, which is again, another kind of layered principle of kind of help, how, helping to bait or better secure things within 365 and Teams specifically. So the next one I wanted to talk about very briefly was entitlement management. And this kind of feeds off the back of access reviews, but this one really does help kind of simplify that usability experience and securing things. So yeah, one of the common scenarios that we always come across are, you know, employees and organization need access to various different components across the spectrum to kind of do their job. So whether it be groups, applications, sites, um, it, it typically is a bundle of things that they need access to. And, you know, users can basically come and go, they can swap roles and basically it's harder to kind of keep track of what they should have access to versus what they shouldn't. And I think it's a challenge that we often find in terms of the joiners, movers, leavers process. And it's one that we always come across. Now, the Azure AD or the Microsoft approach is really entitlement management. So what this is, is the ability to bundle kind of those apps, those teams, those groups all together in one single package and allow basically you allow basic business owners to approve access to those areas. So it might be that um, I'm joining the HR team and we have an entitlement management package that is, you know, the HR SharePoint sites, the HR Microsoft Teams, all the associated applications that have single sign on enabled in Azure AD. And basically we can basically, the single click, we can allow them access to that entitlement. Azure AD is gonna take care of the rest and basically we can then layer on that access reviews piece on top of this so we can have access reviews on that entitlement is the really cool one so again the cycle on the right we can have those entitlements users can request they can if you want them to be able to request we can have it set up like that you can then approve that their access is provisioned then comes the review cycle and around around it goes and again this one i think really does help kind of cut down i guess it really does improve usability and security because users are only getting access to what they need and we're controlling it as kind of a single entity as as, a, as opposed to a lot of disparate uh, you know teams apps groups whatever it may be and sites and that's really the one that that i would like that that's a really cool one yeah now i don't have a question for you on this Luke. more just a comment really go on then um this is i mean this is one that i love as well and i think um you know one of the places where i see this having the most value actually is that whole join us move us leave us process so uh, knowing exactly what someone needs on day one um being able to take away the um kind of work specific things if they move role and shouldn't have access to it anymore and give them access to everything else that they need um and being able to manage it when they leave as well i think um you know for, for me just the 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 ease at which it can simplify a really complex horrible process i think you know this is this is absolutely brilliant mm -hmm. and then i think one of the next ones we would typically talk about say you're rolling out these kind of tools and technologies across your organization i think one of the key things that we want to talk about here and it's a very brief one but if you're talking about securing teams what you really need to look at is how do i secure that team at kind of point of creation is the important thing now, there's a few different schools of thoughts, and I don't want to take a, a, a great deal of time on this one, but it's think, worth thinking about who's creating your teams or how they're being created. Now, we would typically suggest some sort of way of applying the governance at point of time in creation, and also keeping an eye on the governance throughout the life cycle of that team. But I think the most important thing we would typically suggest is we would normally restrict it to a group of users or have a self-approval workflow in there that can apply those governance settings as that group is created. So like I said, the recommendations here, it might not be suitable for all organizations, but it can help supplement orgs without the higher license. So if you wanna configure some settings on a group, often they could be locked away behind kind of uh, higher license levels. We can kind of automate that with the 365 group creation piece. I wasn't gonna dwell on, or delve on that one for so long. I think the, the next one is guest access. And this is really around kind of users coming into our organization. And what we want to do is we really want to say, what I would say is we do want to allow guests in our organizations, certainly in the way that we're working now. We want to be able to work with people from third party organizations. Typically, what I would say is if you restrict your users from working with guests, you know, they're going to find a different way, a different way around it. 
and that security versus usability square, you're going to end up with users basically circumventing the controls you put in place. So the recommendation is get going with guest access. I would enable it on Teams and I would look to kind of use the kind of built in tools within 365 to kind of better govern and manage that. So what do I mean are the built in tools? I think the things I would typically look at here are again calling back to the previous page. When you set up that group, do you want to allow guest access in that team or group? The other thing we can do is basically we can control who's able to act, invite guests into the organization. You may want you know, a set number of people to be able to work with guests or invite them in uh, a set of trusted users, as it were. On top of that, we can use uh, the Azure AD allow and, and block list. So these are really the collaboration settings within Azure AD, and they have the knock-on effect on Microsoft 365 groups and teams. So what we're looking there is you might want to work in an allow and a deny list area. And really what that's going to be is basically I want to, you know, deny people from gmail.com from coming into my tenant. Or it may be that you want to work on an allow basis where you want to add trusted organizations that you work with on a regular basis. We could have them to be set up and basically allowed whenever is the great thing. So they could be automatically uh, any user in your organization could be able to invite someone from, you know, trusted.com or whatever your organization is and whoever they work with regularly. I think the other piece I would look to use, again, it's some of the technology you saw on the previous pages. We can use entitlement management to basically manage that guest access across the piece and have it, you know, packages uh, or entitlements, I would say, access packages as they're called, basically bundled up for guests and use it there. So the, the takeaway here really is get guest access enabled for Teams, try to manage it with the built-in tools, but the key is you, you don't want your users circumventing that. It would be better to have the collaboration taking place in your tenant where you can have visibility and control of it. The next one I wanted to talk about, and I have some more recommendations, and I, I've only got a couple more slides, I think, but the, the key one is really the information and protecting information. So calling back to the shared responsibility model, one of the key ones is kind of document classification and, and document tagging. And one of the key ones here that I like is sensitivity labels. So we in 365, we have the concept of sensitivity labels and retention labels. Uh, I'm not going to talk about retention labels today, but sensitivity labels, it's a it's a tag that's customizable, it's clear text, and it lives, it's persistent with the document. So it persists with that document wherever it goes. And that's what's really powerful kind of about sensitivities, sensitivity labels at the document level. So the concept here is if I apply a sensitivity label to a document and I might mark it as highly confidential, that could apply kind of protection settings that basically allow the document to be encrypted. It could be watermarked. It could be uh, only allowed access for so many days offline. It might just, you might just want it to self-destruct if you really wanted it after, you know, 90 days. But the key here is that no matter where that document goes, so I may be working in a team, one of my users might be working in a team, they may take that document, but if it's been tagged as highly confidential and I move it out of kind of my 365 tenant, and they try to share it with an external party that doesn't have access to that specific document, it's not going to allow them access is the important thing. So that kind of label lives with the document and that protection settings, whatever you configure, also live with the document. Now, I'm sure a few of you have come across since two labels at document level, but the other one I really like at the moment, certainly from a team's perspective and securing teams, is sensitive labels at the container level. Now, previously we used to have kind of a classification scheme on 365 groups, and it was it was pretty naff. It was just like a label. It didn't actually do anything behind the scenes. What we have now is the ability to apply sensitivity labels that you saw in the previous one. Again, it's a way of marking. It's persistent setting. And basically, we can apply that to containers. So whether it's a, a team site, whether it's a 365 group, whether it's Microsoft Teams, it, it's all the same kind of, it's all operating off the Microsoft 365 group. Now, the great thing we can do here is depending on the label you set, we can automatically adjust the privacy of those teams. So whether it's a public or private of the 365 group, we can control external user access. We can also basically change the external sharing for the SharePoint site. And my favorite of all is we can change the level of access from unmanaged devices, which is which is awesome. So the real powerful thing here, and again, I don't think this one is locked behind anything too fancy in terms of licensing level. I think it's probably thrown in basically as part of it, is that you can basically have people classify their teams as confidential, extremely confidential, and the settings for those can be automatically applied as soon as that is basically changed. Now, that for me is one of the most powerful ones going because we can start then 
classifying our teams at a team level. We also have the ability to classify the documents within them, but the real driver here is the ability to mark it at the container level. I think the recommendations I typically apply here are if you have some AIP labels, get them over to sensitivity labels. I'd recommend typically doing different kind of levels for the documents and the groups because typically they might not align. I think we would basically, if you're going to use the default labels that Microsoft give you, review the labels and make sure that the settings are there. So they have a you know confidential public. They might not be suitable for your organization. I think typically what, what I found working with public sector clients, most of the people use the government classification scheme. So it's going to be internal. Uh, wait, it's going to be official, official sensitive. It, that kind of classification scheme is what most people go for in terms of the document level classification. We can scope these sensitive labels to specific users, and I'd recommend that you scope them to a pilot group and, and get them out there really is the thing. Behind the scenes from an admin perspective, I would look to basically review the stats and see what labels are being used, what aren't, and basically take it from there and see which ones are working and which aren't. And I think my final set of slides is really around how do we better protect the data is the one. So I'm not going to dwell too long on data loss prevention, but the idea really is to find sensitive data in your organization to protect it and kind of monitor it. Now, the important part here is really, again, it's building on sensitive labels, but it's really looking for sensitive data that might be leaving your organization. Uh, and that's really what we're looking for here. We can use the LP for inside your organization to find sensitive data to, that might be shared, but typically it's really what we're looking for is external sharing of this data. Now, the key ones I would look at for teams are, are the following. So we have your kind of standard DLP, but we also have data loss prevention for Microsoft Teams. Now, what you'll see on the, the right hand side is we can automatically block messages based on, you know, if they contain sensitive information. So details such as credit cards, date of births, it can automatically go and block that content. So it may be that you don't want them sharing, you know, bank account numbers to external people. We can use DLP to basically stop that in, in kind of flight. Now, the big gotcha here in terms of the data loss prevention for Microsoft Teams is it's kind of cascaded away behind the E5 uh, compliance and E5, I'm pretty sure. And the reason I think I, I understand it to be is that it's the real time processing power that Microsoft had to use to process this kind of as and when um, you actually send the messages. So that's kind of, I think, why they paywalled that one off. Now, the final one that I had in terms of uh, data loss prevention in terms of the technology and I really like this one is data loss prevention for endpoint. So basically this, this plugs into Microsoft Defender and it basically extends the DLP protection across Windows 10 devices. So this stuff is really cool. And if you guys come from a, a like a, Win, or a, a Microsoft information protection is kind of the older technology, this is what we're moving to now. Microsoft 365 endpoint DLP. The great thing is if you're using Defender, you, in Intune, you can basically get going as long as you've got the license. So we can basically stop upload to cloud services or access by un unapproved browsers. We can change how people can use the clipboard and whether they can copy from corporate areas to non-corporate areas. We can stop printing, we can stop copy via Bluetooth, and we can copy, copy over a remote desktop session. So this is actually looking at content on the device as you're working with it and preventing you kind of from, well, you can prevent exfiltration of that data is the key. And the final one I had around data loss hey, prevention. Well, oh, oh, one sorry, sec, Chris. one sec, one sec. I've got a question for you on this one. Um, all right, so um, you know, so we're talking about data loss prevention for endpoint, but mm -hmm. I think um, if we go back to the use cases and in the intro that we had at the start, we talked about the need for end users to be able to work across um, any device. You know, mm -hmm. it may be that there's a shortage, which means that um, you know, organisations just don't have enough to give out to their end users. Yep. And how does this work if I'm on B BYOD? Okay. You know, what what um, how can you protect my data that that way? It's a good question, and and to be honest, I, the the answer for BYOD isn't as compelling. But I, I have a feeling what I would typically do in this scenario. So typically for data loss prevention, if it's a managed device, we would typically use data loss prevention for endpoint. If it's a BYOD device, I, I would probably look to Windows Information Protection. Now, what this does is if I'm on a BYOD device, as that device, as that data leaves the organization, we can have kind of Windows Information Protection policies applied to that data. So it encrypts that data as it leaves. So the common scenario that I would typically work with is say I'm working with an external contractor and they might want to use the OneDrive Sync client to synchronize a team's library. Now, we can use the Windows Information Protection policies to apply specifically to that data uh, and basically encrypt it as it leaves the organization. Now, what this ends up looking like is you'll again have a corporate area 
where you have corporate data on your BYOD device and you'll have a, a personal area. So the idea is that we can't move data from the corporate area into the personal one. And we can do this at the clipboard. We can do this at the file explorer level. It, it's really quite powerful stuff. So we can have a corporate identity kind of word and we couldn't copy from that corporate corporate copy of Word into the kind of personal instance of Word, but we could do it vice versa is the nice one. So that is kind of the best answer, I think, at the moment in terms of for BYOD is I would probably still stick with WIP until there's a kind of, I would hope, a better way because I think the challenge with data loss for prevention for endpoint is kind of the enrollment or the onboarding of those devices. So you'd need to basically make sure that they're using Defender for endpoint. And at that point, that's where it gets a bit trickier for BYOD, in my humble opinion. So I haven't got the best answer on that one, Zoe, but WIP is still more than capable of doing the job. So BYOD, I would typically go for WIP, whereas if I have a corporate managed device, I would probably go for data loss, for, data loss prevention for endpoint. The other thing that we can also do, of course, is sensitivity labels. And again, they'll still be able to access that data uh, when they have an active Azure Active, Azure active Directory account. But if that account was to be disabled, they'd lose access to those files. But that's at the document level is the important one there. And that would be have to apply it on a per document basis where these solutions that we're looking at are more kind of corporate areas, as it were. Now, the, the recommendations I would make from a data loss prevention standpoint, I mean, if you're not using DLP, I would set up two baseline policies pretty quick and I would target the UK kind of pre-built templates that they have. The two baseline policies I would typically have is one that basically looks for a low volume of, of basic detection. So, you know, 10 or less instances, you might just want to allow the user to keep on sharing, but you might want to flag it with a tooltip that you're sharing a large amount of sensitive data. The other DLP policy I'd configure with the same kind of, uh, still looking for the same sensitive information types, but on top of that, I might want to raise a case with my information security team if they have a large number of instances out there. And I might want to block access if they're sharing, you know, over 100 credit cards. We might want to say, yeah, we don't actually want you sharing that externally. So that is kind of the recommendations for DLP. Again, you can get going with any of the, the 365 ones. It's just the teams and the endpoint that you can't do without the E5 license. So I'd recommend getting that one set up to, again, help sensitive data from leaving your organization, regardless of the device. We can get going with that one. And those were kind of my top areas. I think the key themes were them were identity. It was data classification and the, the, those are the two ones that I had there and also kind of the uh, working from any devices probably the, the third one I'm hopeful that I got most of the ones covered there Zoe. Yeah no that's great um all right so thanks Luke now just before I wrap up I, I'm conscious of time so I'll do a quick call for any questions I can see we've had one in the chat which I'm going to direct to you in a, a sec Luke um, but just to summarize really I think it's it's clear as we've gone through this that there are tools out there so there are tools that exist that allow IT to keep our users safe while they work and the organizations along with Microsoft have a responsibility to configure these in line with their own organization policies and actually help people understand what they do as well to keep our end users safe so it is possible to balance usability with security and to be able to let your users use Teams to their heart's content really, but in a way that keeps them safe. Or to put it another way, you can have your cake and eat it. However, there's a catch. It does come with a price and typically, um, you know, to achieve uh, to achieve kind of the full scope of what Luke Sarch was about and some of the other things that you can do, you, you either need to be looking at some of the individual add on licenses for some of these components or to get the best experience where you've got this full defense in depth and it's it's all properly integrated. You do need to start going to that full fat E5 license. But I think the way that we look at it is what you want to do is to get as much value out of E3 as possible. And then you need to work out which are the key areas that are concerns and issues for you, um, you know, and where where you've got things that are causing a problem from a usability perspective that actually a bit of automation or some extra security might help with before before going and investing in E5 because you don't want to start using it until you've got the full value out of E3. Um, but then when you get to E5, there's some really, really awesome, awesome things that you could do and not just from a security perspective as well. Uh, um, right, okay, Luke, you caught I've the seen question. the question. I can I can tackle it. So thank you, Anonymous, um, for asking the question. Is what I would say. With security defaults, can you still use this? Can you still use a service account, e.g., network scanner, to send mail without MFA? And the answer is no. Um, the reason being is that it will basically it will prompt you for MFA. There's there's no way around it, and that's the kind of gotcha with the security defaults. 
is that you can't really customize the rules. But what you could do for that specific scenario is that you could set up an SMTP relay on premise to kind of avoid that is, is the one way that you could work around that. So it may be that you set up an SMTP relay that authenticates on behalf of kind of your scanner. But unfortunately, that's really the kind of shortcomings of security defaults is it's either all in or, or all out, unfortunately. So that's kind of they're obviously trying to get you <laughs> poor, poor guy trying to just use one at service account. Unfortunately, you've got to pay the big bucks to, to actually get the customization. So apologies. Cool. All right. Thanks, Luke. Uh, I cool. think that's all of the questions. Over to you, Shirag. OK, great stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a great session uh, and really kind of you know comprehensive um, coverage of what there is, isn't it, with Microsoft Teams and, and Microsoft 365. So uh, yeah, big thanks to both of you uh, and, and your effort to, to be here with uh, M365 UK. And, uh, and of course, you know, uh, this is always improving. And I, I think I've just heard some of us may have already. We've got Windows 365 <laughs> being introduced, so that's our our cloud PC and uh, yeah, so it's you know all, all to look forward to really, and hopefully that might even cover some of the uh, the endpoints, um, you know, the scenarios that you were just uh, uh, discussing. So yeah, uh, all good stuff, and uh, thanks for answering those questions. And uh, you know, again, once uh, again, big thanks to the attendees for for tuning in, and uh, also Joel Rodriguez earlier on. And so yeah. I've posted a few links in the Q&A window, so uh, the slides recording will be available on Friday and as well as being able to tune into uh, other uh, recordings as well. So um, like I mentioned, um, not doing M365 UK next month because we're just coming out of the restriction, which is great stuff. And so we've got all the summer of August and everything else to look forward to. So we'll be back on the 8th of September and uh, with our new sessions from our new speakers. So uh, stay tuned on uh, meetup.com uh, forward slash uh, M365 uh, UK. And don't forget to uh, fill out the feedback, please, uh, because that really helps out uh, again to Luke and Zoe uh, so they can add, you know, at least add a few things if you if you think you wanted to know something else as well. But other than that, I think um, we will wrap up and uh, yeah, uh, take care, stay well. And once again, big thanks to all our speakers today. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Shrag. Appreciate it. And yeah. You're welcome. All right, lovely. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Have a good one now. Cheers now.